Welcome to Beyond 80 with me, Ben Kay, where we'll be digging into all the main talking points from round three of the Six Nations. A fascinating weekend of action saw Ireland, as everyone expected, coming away with the spoils at home against Wales. Scotland with a fourth victory on the bounce against England, and then everyone expected France to go ahead and destroy Italy, but Italy came so close to their first victory on French soil. Ross Hamilton, our data analyst, will be joining me later in the show as we take a deep dive into all the stats that made the difference this weekend. So lots to get on with, let's get stuck into it. So there probably haven't been many games between England and Scotland where England have gone in as underdogs in recent years, but after three victories by the Scots, on the bounce. I think that was the case this time. So England needed to start big. They did that. We saw the Furbank try and England were playing with much more attacking intent. But that first try from Duan van der Merwe really affected England's confidence. So we start with a scrum just inside England's half. Scotland's put in on the left-hand side. They've set up a diamond formation with Sam Turipolotto at the figurehead of that. But England have this new defensive system, which means that Henry Slade is going to be the man that leads the line up and tries to get in the eye line of the Scottish players so they want to go back towards where the forwards are and not play with wit. So as the ball comes to Tui Pilotto, his eyes, once he receives the ball, divert to Henry Slade and he's watching to see what Slade does. Lawrence, not as quick to get off his man, Tui Pilotto. Henry Slade flying out of the back to try and hit Scotland's number 10, Finn Russell. And just that slight delay of the pass from Tui Pilotto means that Hugh Jones has a gap and perfectly exploited. The high line of England, 13 and 11, have gone really high, means that they now have lost that head start that they might have had on the turn to Duhan van der Merwe. Van der Merwe goes past them, and because of the panic from England, both 14, Tommy Freeman and Furbank, fly in, make the tackle, and that means it's a foot race between George Ford and Duan van der Merwe. George Ford gets there, but five metres out of the line, there's nothing he's going to be able to do to stop the power of van der Merwe. So I think that was the key turning point for the game, because up until that point, England had looked to play with a lot more attacking vigour than we've seen for them for a number of years. And it just got into the psyche, that element of doubt that they didn't quite know what they were doing, maybe just meant there was a hesitation. So we started to see passes not quite going to hand or up at a shoulder. We saw players hesitating on a line and that meant it much more difficult to read for those trying to get them the ball. And England just started to make error after error. And Scotland realised this and felt we didn't have to play that much. And you saw that a lot of Scotland's tries after that came from errors from England. And Duan van der Merwe, obviously the man that had an absolute field day. Ross, thank you for joining us on our Insights by Sage section of the show. Um, let's take the Scotland-England game first. I think as an Englishman, 10 minutes in, I'm thinking, wow, England are actually trying to play a little bit more. And obviously we had the, the Furbank uh, try and, and England 10 nil up and then it all sort of seemed to unravel from there. Yeah, it started well, didn't it? We thought maybe that's a, a corner turn for England. Perhaps didn't pan out that way for the rest of the game and maybe hasn't quite done so for the whole tournament so far. But I had a look at that Furbank try. So that's the first try that we've scored on the first phase in this tournament. So yes, that looked good and that looked sharp, but it didn't necessarily continue that way. England have only made 14 line breaks in the tournament so far and Italy have made fewer. And then our big issue is converting the chances when we get them. We've actually had the second most entries into the opposition 22 of any team. We have the worst red zone efficiency, so points per entry, just 1.75. So we're making opportunities, yes, but we just can't convert. And that seems to be England's big problem. One of the big things that contributes to that is the amount of errors that we made. We made 22 turnovers conceded yesterday. It's the most of any team in any game so far. And actually we've regressed as we've gone on. You think Steve Borthwick talks about getting better week on week. And the more we've been in camp, the more cohesive that we might get. Yet we made 10 errors in the first round, 13 in the second and 22 in round three. So we've just got a little bit worse as it's gone, it gone on. And that's been a big factor to us not being able to take our chances. We've talked about England changing a system and trying to get better week on week. That's evident with the defence and obviously over the first three weeks of the, the tournament that's been a big thing. Scotland's first try, Duan van der Merwe, we've just analysed it, but that was again an error in that England new blitz defence system. 
Well, your, your words there of risk and reward, I think is perfect for a blitz defense and perhaps where England can't, aren't quite getting the balance right. The, the reward from it is by shooting up so quickly, you cause chaos in the attack and they don't know what's going on and you can also catch them behind the gain line. That's one thing that England are doing really well. So that speed has stopped their opposition getting even to the gain line 50% of the time. It's the best of any team so far. However, the risk of that is that perhaps England defenders themselves have to make split second decisions and they get things just slightly wrong. They've missed, England have missed the second most tackle so far and Italy have missed more uh, and they conceded 14 line breaks from that. The risk when you're blitzing as well to a line break is that you're so quickly past the ball. If somebody gets in behind you, it's almost impossible to scramble back. So those line breaks typically lead to tries as well. So that the risk there is then huge. And then looking ahead to our next round, England's next round against Ireland, Ireland have made 30 line breaks in the tournament so far. So it's not going to get any easier for England and they're going to need to progress pretty quickly to stand a chance, you might think. Well, Scotland, if we look at them, they probably didn't attack as much as a lot of people thought, particularly with Finn Russell as the playmaker and that ability that he has to manipulate the blitz defenders. Uh, they didn't need to, though. Uh, they, they were much, much better at capitalising on England's mistakes than the other way around. Yeah, you look at it on paper, which I have done, and almost every attacking stat that we have, England were actually better, only just. The carries, metres made, gain line success, ruck speed, they had faster ruck speed than Scotland, in fact. However, they didn't score, didn't convert their chances, as we mentioned, and that's something that Scotland did. Whether they created that themselves or, or took advantage of England's errors, but Scotland made four line breaks, they converted three of them. That's fantastic. Uh, reward from those line breaks and some of the issues of, of England's defence, as we've said. But the other thing is their red zone efficiency, Scotland's. They scored four points per entry against England when, when England are so poor. Only two times in the tournament so far, a team has scored more than four points, four points or more from their red zones. Both of them are Scotland. Scotland versus Wales in round one and against England in round three. So where they did so well was capitalising on scoring opportunities with Finn Russell at the helm. They looked so much more controlled and in in charge of what their game was about. They scored where England didn't. Okay, Ross, let's look at uh, France, Italy. And if Scotland, England was a game of two halves, uh, that one was as well. I, I guess the question we're all asking is, is what's happened to France? They're, they still seem to be OK when they're not close to the line, but just not able to convert opportunities. Yeah, from the team of the World Cup just a few months ago or previous Six Nations, just not the same as we've expected from them. France had 10 entries into Italy's red zone, into their 22. Only Ireland have made more entries in a game in the tournament so far. So they had opportunities, yet they only scored seven points in total from those entries. So their efficiency is 0.7. Only Italy, in fact, were worse when they had scored no points against Ireland. But yes, creating opportunities, sure. We'd expect them to walk those in in previous years or competitions. They just didn't do it on the weekend, and that was their big flaw that got them into a little bit of trouble later on. Well, I mentioned game of two halves. Uh, you know, I think we all sat there at half-time thinking France have blown so many opportunities, they're going to, going to carry on and start, start scoring them. But it didn't happen. Italy were much, much better in the second half. Yes, they were obviously helped by the red card from Dante that sort of happened during half-time with the upgrade to the, from the bunker. But nonetheless, they still had to come out and play, and they, and they did so. I had a look at uh, ruck speed. It's something that we often look at of a team's attacking intent and momentum. France in the first half had 65% of their rucks under three seconds, Italy just 42. In the second half, that completely switched around. So France had 43%, Italy 60%. So you think about attacking and tender momentum, getting their hands on the ball and getting some front foot ball. Italy really changed that around and they did really well. What that then leads to is their, their scoring opportunities. Now, they didn't have a very good red zone efficiency in the first half themselves. They only had three entries and came away with the kicks for three points. They only had two entries in the second half, but they scored 10 points from them. So that was the difference. France actually scored, scored zero points from their entries in the second half. Italy scored 10 from their two. So got themselves into a position where they could have, should have won it. Came away with a draw nonetheless. Let's go on to the, the final game of the weekend, Ireland Wales. Wales really showed a lot of resilience because they, they were nearly blown away in the first half. Yeah, I, Wales only seem to be playing for one half in their games. They need to put together two halves of, uh, in a single game. They were 20 nil down against Scotland in the first game, 27 now, nil down just after that. They were actually 14-5 up against England, but then they didn't score a point in the second half. They were 17 nil down against Ireland in that first half. So if they can put together an 80-minute performance with that resilience you're talking about, then they might be in these games. 
but that first half especially, Ireland just seemed to dominate them and their best form of defence was attack. They dictated everything and gave Wales very little to play with themselves, so they were very, they were rarely under stress. Uh, so much so that Wales only had 31% of possession. They made 29 carries only in the first half for 70 metres, made no line breaks and only beat two defenders. So yes, just didn't get into a position where they could stress Ireland in, in any way. There was something I looked at for Wales as well, Tip, similar to France and England, where they're not quite scoring and taking uh, their chances as well as they might hope. We have a stat at the moment called expected points. It takes a look at the attacking opportunities of a team in the position, real life situation, and the points that they should have scored based off of their own historical data. Wales have a higher ex expected points than their actual points in every game so far. So they've underperformed in scoring is the main takeaway from that. The other thing from Wales as well is that their points expected or actual have dropped game on game. So they scored 26 points in the first round, 14 in the second and just seven in round three. So they are just not scoring enough the same way that we might say that for France and England, just not converting the chances that they are making just not scoring enough to be able to stress teams, especially somebody like Ireland. Uh, we've talked a lot about sort of mistakes and things, and often, you know, that is the difference in rugby. But I guess Ireland are, are the blueprint for how teams want to play at the moment. So from a data perspective, why are they doing things so much better than everyone else? There's so much of Ireland we could go through. We'll try and limit it. Um, but they make the game look really easy. It, it looks easy, their attack, to me, when you're watching it. It looks like nothing's stressing them. Uh, and they can do what they want. A big part of that is their, their confidence and their skill level. And that's throughout the whole team. We talk about that modern game forwards getting involved as well. Their skill level is off the charts. So part of that is obviously their passing. They have made the most passes in the tournament so far, 660. That's nearly 200 more than the next most in Wales for a total of just under 4,000 meters. Again, 1,000 meters more than the next, which is Wales again. That's just in three rounds. Now, one thing we look at of a team of the style of attack that they're trying to play, to, to have a look at their uh, intent with the ball is a pass to kick ratio. So Ireland pass eight times for every one kick they make. That's the most in the tournament. On average for everybody else, that's 4.9. So it just shows how much they want to keep the ball in their hands and play with it rather than kick it away, which perhaps is a little bit negative coming into the game these days. A couple of other things is passes per possession. So every time Ireland have the ball in their hands, how many passes they play before they turn it over. They average seven per possession. That's the most in the competition. They manage nine per possession versus Wales and the amount of occasions where they have 10 or more passes in a possession is 22 in the tournament, no one else has had more than 12. So just their intent to keep the ball, play with it, stress the opposition, dictate their attack, by using all those passing, it is amazing. And I think it's a really positive thing to see. And it's great that one of the best teams in the world are employing this kind of style because it's really good to watch as well. Yeah, it's not just about winning a collision, is it? And I think, you know, when we talked about the, the errors in defence from England, for example, if you think about a defensive system, at any snapshot of time, everyone should know who they've got. But if that point is constantly changing, you're constantly having to change that snapshot and know who, you, who you've got to defend. So it becomes a lot more stressful. And even if you don't necessarily make the line breaks, you can't go forward with as much vigor. You have to take a hesitation to check that you've got the right person. Which is exactly what Ireland do and is exactly why they are the best attacking team, at least in the world, certainly in the Six Nations. Uh, we have the smart ball data that tracks the, the length of passes. So whilst Ireland have the most passes, they have the shortest average width of pass. So you, you're thinking they're employing a lot, a lot of short passes to get around those defences, to be able to pick them off and play where they want to play. So that's the other thing. So passing is one thing, but where that gets them is, is, is big, playing into space where the defenders aren't. Ireland uh, have their first point of contact with the defence more than 10 metres away from the previous breakdown, 48% of the time, that's the most. So almost more often than not, they're playing further than 10 metres away than they are close to that breakdown. Trying to find the space where the defenders are weaker or weak shoulders, those kind of things. And the second thing that we look at is the amount of times that Ireland play wider than the first receiver. So whoever that player is, forward or back or otherwise, takes a pass from the nine, he almost always passes that ball again onto somebody else, more than anybody else in the tournament. So that point of contact is further away from all of those defensive bodies around the ruck. They can control that point of contact much better. So once Ireland have started to move teams around, uh, I guess that's the point of it, that they're never playing in front of a structured defence. So their whole roll-on effect of that becomes a lot more prominent. 
Yes, one of the best things, one of the things they are best at is committing those defenders into a position and then playing away from them into the space. So I had a look at how many tacklers they committed in total. They've, com they've committed the most in the tournament so far, 422. That's also the most per ruck that they have because they do have a lot of rucks. They also then commit the most defensive players to those rucks, 239 on top of those tacklers, so as well as. But the thing is with that is they don't let those players affect their own ball. Ireland still have the fastest average ruck speed. So what they're doing is committing all of these bodies in one place, typically on the floor and out of the game, and then getting the ball away quicker so that you can then play into disruptive, disorganized defense where the players are not there. The thing that with Ireland especially that I see and why it's so easy, it looks so easy, is because they just continue to compound their momentum. If you can get a carry over the gain line, commit all these players to the floor, get the ball away, the next phase is then easier still. And again and again and again. So I had a look at some of their data for their ruck speed when they get over the gain line. So Ireland already have the fastest average ruck speed, 3.34 seconds. When they get over the gain line, their ruck speed is out on average 2.89 seconds. So faster again. And that just gives the defense no time whatsoever to be able to adjust or be prepared for the next threat. Ireland are then playing against weak shoulders. And you do that three, four, five times. The, the defense is all over the place, disorganization everywhere, line breaks are happen, and then you can go and score tries off of the back of it. Their forward momentum, their ability to stay on top of defenses is amazing. And again, should be the blueprint for everybody else. A big part of everything you've just said, Kieran Frawley's try, and that's something that, that we're gonna go ahead and look at a little bit later on. But for now, Ross, thank you so much for all your insight and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. So over to the Aviva Stadium and Ireland look like they're on a procession to the title this year. Bounce back from that disappointment at the World Cup to kick on to another gear from where they were in last year's Six Nations. Such a threat in attack that it just means defences cannot get comfortable and they cannot get any structure on the game. So we're just going to take a quick look at some of the different ways that Ireland manipulate a defence to get outside them. The first thing we have to say is they still need some momentum. They still need to be able to win the meters in contact. So the decision making is all around their number four here at the point of this diamond formation. He has two forwards either side ready to clear him out and the 10 in behind ready to play slightly wider. His cue is to watch the Welsh number four. If the Welsh number four and the defenders either side of him don't put much line speed on, he has the ability to stand still but then carry himself into contact knowing that it's going to be a quick latch from six and seven and they're going to be able to create quick ball for 10, 12 to play slightly wider. The next option he's got, if one of those players either side of the Welsh four is a little bit slow off the line, he can obviously tip the ball out to the number seven on his outside and then him and six go and clear out. Or the second option is the ball back inside and again, he and number seven go and make a quick clearance. Very, very basic rugby. Do this a couple of times though and the Welsh team start worrying about losing collisions and become a little bit more aggressive in their defensive pattern. Having lulled Wales into a bit of a false sense of security, the heavy runners are going to keep coming at them and keep winning those yardage. Wales are probably going to start to narrow up slightly defensively and again the Irish number four is going to watch his opposite number and say is he coming out of the line to try and blitz me? If he isn't, he still needs to carry himself so that he holds those defenders, but they're trying to play around the eight. So the Welsh eight defender is the end of the, the heart of the Welsh defence. So four carries, starts to go towards the line, and then as the tackler is completely committed, he pulls the ball back to his number 10, and then this is the difference with the Irish. They know there's a blitz defence probably going to come up on the outside, so it's all about getting two quick passes through 12, through 5, and then carrying into the wider channels as we're looking. If, as Alan were expecting with Wales, a blitz defence in that channel with the number four flying out of the line, trying to make a chop tackle, you actually want to invite them towards you. You want them to oversell themselves. The key there, if you see them coming, is to stand and deliver. So you stand where you are, you can't be chop tackled, they can't use your momentum against you. You let them come, you just do exactly the same movement. Pull it back to 10, 
you know that outside the number eight's gonna come up much quicker this time. So it's gonna have to be really, really quick hands. Just take and give, and you see that straight through, and now you're outside of the corner of the defense. As soon as you get outside of that corner, and that's what all these movements are about, trying to get outside the corner of the heart of the Welsh defense, Wales have to defend differently. They become a side-on defense rather than a blitz defense, and you have easy meters on the outside at the very least, if not a line break. So as we've just seen, Ireland have so many ways of getting outside defences and beating defences. Once they get into the red zone, it's no different. A lot of teams, when they get to the red zone, they just go to that pick and go, very predictable, try and out-muscle teams. You can't afford to just muscle up defensively when you play against Ireland on your own line. We saw a great example of this with the Kieran Frawley try. Came from a line-out maul. Alan drove, didn't quite get there. So as we join the end of the maul, you have two viable options in James Lowe and Bundy Aki, which means Aki's carry is a one-on-one. -on -one. He manages to win that collision, get extra meters in the contact, which does two things. Ties in extra Welsh bodies that have to come in and assist on the tackle. But those players that are coming from the maul to defend for Wales, coming around the corner, have to retreat behind their own goal line to get around the corner. They then do a tight carry, as you might expect this tight out with uh, Conan carrying deep into the Welsh defenders. The next lot of Welsh defenders that come around the corner have to retreat even more, but they're expecting more of the same, a tight in carry. Alan bring three forwards round the corner, but the ball flashes across the face of them to Kieran Frawley, who spotted a huge gap to go in untouched under the posts. Another hugely impressive performance from Andy Farrell's men. I guess the question is, how does anyone stop them? Wales put in a, a a decent enough performance. I think the difference between the two teams was how more predictable uh, Wales were in the Irish red zone than the other way round. I don't think you can stop a team like Ireland just by defending them. I think they'll find a way to get it done. So the key will be, can England next up stop Ireland at the breakdown? Obviously, Wales had Tommy Raffel in their ranks and Ireland managed to deal with him pretty well. But for me, England will be going particularly hard at the breakdown in training next week to ensure they give themselves at least a chance when Alan comes to Twickenham. So as we move on to the France-Italy game, another game of two halves. France should have put the game away in the first half. Got into Italy's red zone so many times, but unlike France a year, two years ago, they just weren't able to capitalise. Really sloppy in terms of some of the passes they were making, some of their handling, some of the hesitation on their decoy lines, just meant that it wasn't the France of old. Conversely, Italy had so many less opportunities, but in the second half, when it really mattered, they took it. So let's have a look at that Kapowatsu try. So we joined this try on the final phase, but in the phases leading up, Italy had been so good at keeping their shoulders square, almost stepping back into the inside shoulder of the tackle that was coming to Towards them but still getting that pass away and it just preserved the space remember at this point in the game Jonathan Dante was off the field so Italy had a man advantage but they exploited that with that direct running shoulders square and holding the defenders so if we look at the final phase Varney at the nine at the base now has got what, a six on two here in the in the wide channel because of the work that the other players have done. Ball is passed across to Garbisi, but crucially, rather than drifting on the pass and using that uh, overlap on his outside, he steps back inside LaBelle. LaBelle's forced to commit to the tackle. He manages to release the pass back. Italy have number 20 coming on a decoy line, which holds the French 15, Ramos, and the ball goes behind him to Lucchese. They've now effectively created a four on two. Ramos manages to get off, but outside him, Pano realises he's never going to get across with any real conviction, so has to try and shut the door on the outside on Marine. He does well to get there, Ramos, but Marine pulls off a miracle pass right over the top to Kapowatsu, who dives in to set up a grandstand finish. So I think the big thing about this game is what has happened to France. Two years ago, they were able to score those tries at will, and now there's so much hesitation. Is it a World Cup hangover and the disappointment of not being able to do what they intended to in a home World Cup? Or is it maybe some of the selections because of Dupont going off to the sevens? They also lost them to Mac as well. You haven't now got that Toulouse midfield axis that have been so important to controlling the French style of play over the last few years. From an Italy perspective, so much better. That ability to hold defenders. They've gone from a team that was really, really physical 
uh, around the turn of the century, I guess, and it was all based on their power. They then went through a phase of trying to play all out attacking rugby. They now seem to have married the two and that combination of the attacking rugby, but with some structured detail of how you control the defenders in you. I think they look a much more complete team than they ever have done before and had that kick penalty kick at the end to win it. We all thought it was going to be Italy's first victory on French soil, but the new law of the shot clock scuppered them when the ball fell off the tee in an indoor stadium. I mean, the lawmakers couldn't have predicted that, right? Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed looking back at all the detail of round three of the Six Nations. Join us after round four for another episode of Beyond 80.